Good day. My name is Randy Starnes, and I'd like to welcome you to our life group lesson this morning. This morning, we're going to look at Psalm 90. Psalm 90, the only psalm that is identified to have been written by Moses. There are other psalms that appear Moses may have written just by the language and the style of his writing. This is the only psalm that Moses is identified as the author, as the man of God. And we're going to get into that this morning. Before we do, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time this morning to be in your word again. We thank you, Father, that you collected a group, a, a number of psalms, 150 psalms, and put them together in a book for us to read about the escapades, the highs and the lows of people. Lord, we relate to the Psalms. We thank you, Father, that you did not hide emotions that come through these Psalms and that we can identify with in our own lives. And we thank you, Lord, that in every way you overcome the difficulties, the anxieties, and the strifes. You have a power that helps us to overcome these things we deal with in our lives. So bless us now as we read your word. Help us to learn more about you this morning than we've known before because our desire is to know you more as you reveal yourself to us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Psalm 90, the oldest psalm that we know of in the 150 psalms that we have, written by Moses. Moses is described in the beginning of this psalm as a man of God, the man of God. Uh, he's also described this way by Caleb in the book of Joshua. He's also described as a man of God in the book of Ezra. Um, it's possible that Moses wrote this psalm after the Israelites' failure of faith in Kadesh Barnea. Uh, when the nation was condemned to journey in the wilderness for 40 years because of their unbelief. Following that tragedy, Moses experienced the death of his sister, Miriam. He experienced the death of his brother, Aaron. And between those two deaths, he also suffered because of his own failure of obeying God when he struck the rock that poured forth the water. You know, Moses had a very difficult life, a very hard life. His life was extremely difficult, but he triumphed. He triumphed, and in the psalm, he shares his insights so that we too might have strength for the journey and that our life might end well. So let's get into Psalm 90. We want to read the whole psalm. It's brief. First two verses, as you turn in your Bibles to Psalm 90, say, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Numbers 33 tells us that there are 42 different places that Israel camped during their 40-year journey of wandering in the desert. But no matter where Moses lived, God was always Moses' home. He lived in the Lord. Moses lived in the Lord. He knew how to abide in the Lord, how to find strength, comfort, encouragement and help for each day's demands. Let's look at Exodus 33 verses 7 through 11 to see to see about how Moses met with God. Exodus 33 in your Bibles verses 7 through 11 here's how Moses would meet with God. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away. 
away from where all the Israelites were encamped as they wandered in the desert, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance, while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped, each at the entrance to his tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. How do we make God our dwelling place? How do we make God our dwelling place? Let's compare Moses' tent with our tent. And we want to do that by looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 5. And this is what this scripture says. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose, and has given us the Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Guaranteeing what is to come. So back to Psalm 90. What is Moses saying in verse 2 here? which says, Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Moses is saying here, God has no beginning. God is forever. God is eternal. Eternal past, eternal future. And I don't know about you, but I can't grasp that. I can't get my mind around the fact that God has no beginning. Everything I know about in my life I can point to a beginning but you can't do that with God and that's what makes him God he has no beginning Moses is saying to us in verse 2 now in verses 3 through 12 we're gonna see that we are students of life and life is our school in the school of life we need to know and learn two important lessons first Life is brief, and it passes swiftly. So make the most of it. We're going to see that in verses 4 through 6. And secondly, life is difficult, and at times seems futile. But this is sometimes the only way that we can mature in our lives, and we're going to read about that in verses 7 through 11. Verse 3. You turn men back to dust, saying, Return to dust, O sons of men. If you went back to Genesis 3, verse 19, we read there that God took us from the ground. He took us from dust. He formed us, which is one of the things that makes us so special. In creation, we are the only living beings that God says he formed Every other living being in Genesis, he spoke, and it came to pass. So we're special. He took us from dust. He formed us from the dust. But he also says, when we die because of sin, 
we return to dust. And that's where you see people bury in the movies and always say dust to dust, ashes to ashes. We return to dust. Why is it important to know this? Well, people try to defy life, try to defy the end of life. We, we have our diets, we, we do our exercise. In the end, it's good for our health. Paul says that exercises has some benefit, but we cannot defy death. And it's futile that we try to defy death. People try to do that. No one is going to live but the appointed time God gives us to live. Let's look at verse 4. For a thousand years are in your sight. For a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. Simply, God is not restrained by time. He's not restrained by time. And when we talk about, when Moses refers to a watch in the night, a watch was, was four hours. Typically a four-hour time period was what people who stood on guard for anything in a watch were expected to stand on guard for. Four hours. Three watches during the night. Usually that watch went from 6 to 10, 10 to 2, 2 to 6 a.m. In, in the morning. And a watch passes. A watch is something that happens quickly. And life is like that. Our lives go quickly. They go through very fast. Verses 5 and 6. You sweep men away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. Though in the morning it springs up new, by evening it is dry and withered. Soil in the Middle East can be very thin. And there are a lot of areas in the Middle East where grasses are lush. They grow from the morning dew. They shoot up fast like mushrooms in my yard. <laughs> I can watch those mushrooms grow quickly. And the grass in the Middle East will do the same thing. It'll shoot up. A field will look lush. And then by evening... When that sun is pounding down upon that desert, it withers up. It withers up and dies. And the ground remembers it no more. Almost like when we think about the parable of the seed and the sower, one of those seeds, as you remember, sprang up quickly in excitement about God, but there was no root because there was no soil. It was too thin and it withers up and it blows away. Let's look at uh, verses 7 through 11. 7 through 11. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. The length of our days is 70 years, or 80, if we have the strength. Yet, their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. You know, interestingly, King David lived to be only 70 years old. That's... Um, not related to exactly what we're talking about, but I, found, I find that to be interesting. I always assumed David lived longer than 70. He lived to be 70. Joshua lived to be 110. Moses died at 120. But David only lived to be 70 years old. So these, these verses here reflect the sad experience of the people in an area called Kadesh Barnea. And you know that story about God told Moses to take one of each tribe and send them into the land that God was giving them, the land flowing with milk and honey. That land was Canaan. And he sent them as scouts, and Moses told them to come back and bring a report about the land, about what they found about the people, what they found about the land itself, what they found about the crops that were grown there, and bring that report back for God's giving this land to us. Well, what happens is they come back 
And ten of these men are scared to death about the people being huge. They even relate them to the Nephilim, make things up. But the people are too big. The land is lush, but we can't do anything about these people. So they refuse to take the land that God's given them. Why? Because of their lack of faith. And only two of the men who went had the faith that God gave them, Joshua and Caleb. And they were penalized. God's wrath came upon the people of Israel and all people 20 years old of age and older were condemned to wander in that desert, die in the desert, and never see the land that God gave them simply because of their lack of faith. God did bless Caleb and Joshua to go into the promised land because of their faith. And Moses here in these verses 7 through 11 appears to be writing about that sad experience at Kadesh Barnea. Let's look at verse 11 particularly. Verse 11 says, Who knows the power of your anger? For your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. Let me ask you a question. How much fear is due God? A lot of fear. Unmeasurable fear is due God. Not to be afraid of God as in, I'm scared to death and I'm paralyzed, but holy awe and wonder and respect. And this scripture says that his wrath is as great as that, which would mean to me his wrath is great. His wrath is huge. And his wrath has been poured out now on the Israelites because of their lack of faith. Who can measure the fear due him? Verse 12, teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. I don't know about you, but this is the desire of my heart as I grow older to number my days aright. We tend to number our years in our lives. We, we tend to count the years and and look at the number of years when we really need to be counting our days. The days of our lives. The days. And, and we all have to live one day at a time, don't we? We live one day at a time, and we don't know how many days we have left. Some of us are blessed to know our days, perhaps because of illness. There actually is a blessing in knowing the number of days you have it gives you a great opportunity to have your days aright and to have your life ready. But many of us, without illness or we're carefree, we don't number our days. We just number our years and we live happy-go-lucky. Scripture here tells us to do something very different. We don't know how many days are left. A successful life is marked by successful days that honor the Lord. Let's read uh, the final verses in this psalm, verses 13 through 17, and see that as believers, the future is our friend. 13 through the end of the chapter. Relent, O Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us, make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. So in spite of the black border that is around Psalm 90, the emphasis here is on life, not death. You can see the difference between verses 7 through 12 and these verses in 13 through 17. When Jesus is our Lord and Savior, 
the future is our friend. Particularly, let's look at verse 14. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. As we read this, Moses may also be including the thought about manna that was supplied to the Israelites every morning, six days a week. They would go out and gather that manna. And he may be including that. In, in this verse, in, that, in the thought of this verse, of meeting the physical needs of the people. When we begin the day with the Lord and we feed on His Word, then we walk with Him throughout the day and enjoy His blessings, just like Moses is talking about here. Moses prayed that God would give him and his people as much joy in the future as the sorrow that they had experienced in the past. And Paul may have had this in mind when he wrote Romans 8, 18. We're going to flip over and look at Romans 8, 18. He may have the very same thought in mind when he wrote this verse, which says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Wow. And he also was probably thinking the same when he wrote 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 16 through 18. 2 Corinthians 4 16 through 18 where Paul says, therefore we do not lose heart Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. But what is unseen is eternal. The glory to come far exceeds the suffering we bear today. Moses lost his temper and he could not enter the promised land. But, think about it, Moses did get to the promised land when he met with Jesus on that mountaintop with Elijah and the three disciples, he got there. We don't think about that. That time of Christ being covered in light in the transfiguration, Moses was there. So he actually did get into the promised land. A very interesting story. To summarize, life is brief. So Moses prayed, teach us. Life is difficult, so Moses prayed, satisfy us. In verse 17, Moses said that work at times seems futile. So he prayed, establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. God answered those prayers for Moses, and he will answer them for us too. The key message of Psalm 90, the future is our friend when Jesus is our Savior and Lord. I want to thank you today for joining us for our life group lesson. I hope you have a wonderful week.